Good morning. morning. Great to see everybody. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. My name is David, and I am the Director of Music and Worship, and I just want to say good morning. Welcome to our worship service. This is a great day to be here. How many of you all grew up in the Methodist Church? Anybody grow up in the Methodist Church? Yeah, all right. How many of you didn't? Yeah. I grew up Southern Baptist, and uh, boy, they got a good hymnal too, let me tell you. But we grew up Southern Baptist, and one of the things I like about being a Methodist is that John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, he really challenged and challenges us to think, think for ourselves, and um, to doubt and to question, and I like that. I like that about the Methodist faith, because what happens is when you think, oh, no, you're, you're challenging our faith. No, you actually come out on the other side of that, usually stronger in your faith. So today we're going to doubt, we're going to question, we're going to find out about our favorite disciple as we worship today. So let's prepare our hearts for worship.
Please stand as you are able for our responsive call to worship, hymn number 304 and our opening prayer. Faith never comes easy. Thomas, a faithful disciple of Jesus, doubted the post-resurrection appearance and needed to see Jesus himself. How we are like Thomas, we often think that we must see to believe. How blessed are the ones who, never having seen, yet have come to believe. Open up our hearts, Lord, this day to absolute faith in you, that although we may have not seen the risen Christ, we may believe fully in him. Amen. pray. God of miracles in the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ, you overturn natural laws. Thank you for the patience Jesus showed to Thomas, who was afraid that it was too good to be true. You still do wonders, transforming people's lives by your spirit, working through your disciples like us. Direct us to strengthen the ministries of this church, especially among people who struggle with doubt or feel distant from you. We pray through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Amen. How's that? <laughs> Our ushers are coming down. They're bringing the uh, uh, attendance pads, and thank you for the information you provide us there. While you're, while you're uh, filling that out, let me invite you to get out your bulletin. A couple things that I wanted to lift up to you today. 
this afternoon at 4.30. Everybody say 4.30. 4.30. We're going to be right back here for a fantastic concert uh, celebrating 60 years of the Franklin County Band. Now, you may not have any, uh, you know, dog in that, in that show, but listen, this is going to be a great, great event. Our Capital City Band is going to be here. Uh, Josh Toppis, who is currently the uh, director of the Franklin County Band, will be here to direct. Uh, our own David Goins will be directing. Our own uh, First United Methodist Church Chancel Choir will be singing. And it's gonna be a great, great celebration. Uh, we've heard them rehearse, they're just fantastic. And so we hope that you'll be here for that at 4.30 today. This is the last of our Summer Chautauqua series. And it's been a great series and thank you for your support of it throughout the entire summer. A couple of other things I wanted to mention uh, that's not, one's not in your bulletin. Tuesday at 6.30 is our SPR meeting and we wanna remind all of you on that committee to be present for that. You can take a look at all the other activities. There are upcoming events uh, getting ready to take place, so we've given you some teasers on that. And so take your bulletin home and be a part of everything happening here at uh, First United Methodist Church. Coming up, though, in September, uh, we will, the nominations committee will be doing, once again, as we always do, preparation for nominating leadership for next year. And in that process, one of the things that we want to do is kind of give all of you a broad brushstroke, if you will, about the committees that uh, we have here at the church who take on that leadership. Today, we want to talk real quickly about two of our committees, uh, the Finance Committee. The Finance Committee obviously deals with money. Except uh, those of you on the finance committee know that you don't actually touch the money. Uh, you all uh, prepare the budgets. You all oversee that. And uh, uh, anyway, and helping the staff and so forth uh, be good stewards of that. The finance committee meets about every other month, uh, usually uh, about uh, for an hour or so. And then in the fall, they may have an extra meeting as they're building the budget process and going through that. So uh, it's a very, very important meeting. If you have accounting experience or maybe banking experience or whatever uh, that might uh, lend itself to that, we would love for you to uh, at least uh, put your name down that you'd be willing to serve on that team. Uh, we need uh, good leadership there, and we appreciate that. The second committee that we want to mention today is the Board of Trustees. Philip Sturgill, who is the chair of the trustees, is here. And we're going to invite him to come and share with you just a quick overview of what that team does as well. Philip, welcome. Philip Sturgill. Uh, trustees, our role is to oversee the physical property of the church, so all the land and all the buildings. And uh, our, our campus is made up of five buildings, not counting the Wesley Center. We have an average age of about 155 years on our building. So as you can imagine, at times it's quite challenging, but also, uh, also rewarding. We meet every other month on the second Tuesday for about an hour to an hour and a half, depending upon what we have going on this year. The meetings have run a little long. Uh, we've had a pretty ambitious uh, ex ex or expensive year as we work on replacing the roof on the Todd House, making those repairs along with any other maintenance needs that, uh, that come up. Thank you, Philip. And one of the cool things about being on the trustees is we'll show you where all the secret passages are. So uh, anyway, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But anyway, it is a great uh, committee to, to work on, and we appreciate that. And uh, Patrick, I figured out what's wrong with my mic. Just give me a minute, okay? It's called It's Not plugged in <laughs> anyway <laughs> anyway we'll get to that in a moment a lot of you have called me or contacted me about um, my opinion especially as it's related to the recent shootings in El Paso and in Dayton and um, ongoing issues related to guns and violence in our in our in our in our uh, nation I have written an open letter, and um, it is, um, I'm, not, I'm not handing it out, it's available to you if you would like to read it. We've got copies out here, and there's some around different places in our public places, and it just says an open letter, and you are welcome to take that, take one of those and review it. If you have questions or comments, I certainly would be happy to uh, have a conversation with you about it. It is an issue, we know that, and uh, we've got to deal with that. And so. Uh, I just make that offering to you, 
I'm not going to make any political statements from the pulpit, but I just wanted to offer a simple open letter. Now, friends, let's prepare our hearts and let's go to the Lord in prayer. loving God as we gather in this place today we recognize once again the power of your your presence in our living and how we are blessed in so many and wonderful ways we look around in this very room and we recognize how you touch our lives through brothers and sisters and how what a joy it is to see one another to kind of catch up on things and and to have that conversation, to embrace one another and encourage each other. Families, brothers and sisters, neighbors gathered together. And how grateful we are that your presence through the Holy Spirit is in this place. Lord, today we come to you and we acknowledge that we're not always what you want us to be. Our lives are broken by the sin of, our, of what we do and don't do. And we pray, Lord, once again, as, as we always do, for your forgiveness. Through the mercy and grace that we find in Christ, we have a promise of new and a fresh start. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and guiding us through that. We, guide, we come here today and, and give to you our concerns and needs. We recognize the sick and the hurting. We recognize those, Lord, that are recovering from surgery and those preparing for surgery. We recognize those, Lord, that are in treatment or in rehabilitation. And as always, God, we come to your Son, Jesus Christ, the author of healing, of life, death, and eternal life. And we pray that your healing be upon us. Now, Lord, in this hour, as we study the Word and we celebrate your message to us today, we pray that you would be with each of us in our homes and our families and be with those that lead, those that lead in our community, in our nation, and in our world. Lord, help us to be attracted to the peace that only you can give. And as always, God, protect those that provide the freedom and the liberty we have to worship in this place today. Bless us now as we unite our hearts and our voices and we pray together that prayer that you taught your own disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth.
invite our children to come forward. Anybody else want to come up? I mean, there's plenty of room. Else can nope. <laughs> okay, that's good. Okay, so somebody told me something really silly earlier. I don't want to mention any names, but it starts with a D and it rhymes with Dr. Phil. <laughs> Hi. Anyway, he's got this really strange thing. He's, he's trying to pull one over on me. He thinks that there's like this invisible stuff everywhere. All around us, there's this invisible stuff. He's even got a fancy name for it. He calls it air. I don't believe him. I don't see any air. Do you see any air? Uh-uh. I don't think it exists. He's trying to, uh, he's, he's telling a fib. What do you think? What do you think, Asher? Is he making this up? No? <laughs> Emma's already heard it. Braley, is he making this up? No? How do, I don't see it. How do you know air is real? <laughs> yes, Braley. What do you mean how you talk? You talk with air. Some people have lots of air when they talk, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> how else do you know air is real? I'm just kidding. I know air is real. Wouldn't it be weird if I didn't think air was real? But how do we how do we know air is real? We can't see it. Yes, Emma. You can feel it. That's true. If I took a fan and went like this, can you feel the air? Yeah. How else? Oh, 
if you throw a frisbee, the air keeps the frisbee. What about if it's um, if you look outside and the trees are moving? That's the air, right? Right, Kronos? Yeah. What if you look outside and the tree's not moving? Are you like, oh no, there's no air today? There's always air. Even if you don't see the trees moving, it's still there, right? That's the way God, that God works. Have you guys ever actually seen God? No. But we know he's there, don't we? We can feel him in our hearts. We can see the effects of God by people when somebody does something nice. That is an effect of God that we can see. Now, just like I said with the tree, sometimes you look out at the tree and it's not moving. That doesn't mean that the air is not there. It just means maybe you need to wait a little bit before you can see it. Sometimes people will say, you know, there's a lot of bad things going on. I, I don't think God's there. Sometimes you just have to wait. Sometimes you have to look somewhere else, look at a different tree to see what God is doing. Does that make sense? So even though we can't see him, he's always there with us, just like the air that we breathe. Okay? Um, let's see. Some of you already started school, right? Braley, you started school. Did you start school yet? Any of you guys? No. You start this week? No, yeah. Do you start this week? Hmm? Wednesday? Yeah, me too. Okay. So maybe we should say a prayer for um, people going back to school this week as well. All right? Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your, um, your presence. Even if we don't see it sometimes, we know that you're always there. Help us as we go back to school this week to see you in other people and to have other people see you in us. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing. standing for the reading of the gospel and before I read that let me ask you a question how many of you ever doubt can you raise your hand anybody in this room okay ever hear somebody say oh I'm doubting that or I just can't believe that 
Sometimes people question us when we doubt something, especially when it comes to our faith. And I want to propose to you today that doubt is not a bad thing. Hear now the gospel from the Gospel of John, beginning in chapter 20 at verse 19. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, this is following Jesus' crucifixion. The doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. And Jesus came and he stood among them and he said to them, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. And so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and I put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. That's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Be seated. This morning I'm thinking that whether you grew up in the church or not, somewhere along the way you've probably heard that phrase, Doubting Thomas. Poor old Thomas. He was a real man, and he has caught grief for the last 2,000 years because of the scripture that I just read to you. And to be honest, I'll tell you, I kind of feel for the guy because tradition has singled him out as having very little faith because... He actually expressed his doubt in the resurrection. And because of that, whenever somebody doubts, you may hear them say, What are you, a doubting Thomas? <laughs> and even if they've never heard the Bible's story, they've still heard that phrase, doubting Thomas. Now Thomas appears to be a man who has a crack in his wall of faith. And, and doubt is oozing out here. Can you really blame him? I mean... What he is asked to accept was beyond reality, and it was fantastic. And you've got to keep in mind that he's hearing about the resurrection secondhand. The other disciples have had the advantage of actually seeing Jesus in person, and they did that a few days prior. So, for Thomas, not really having this encounter with the risen Lord, what he's hearing is a from this delirious disciples, it is a bit unbelievable. I mean, even for those of us today who know the rest of the story, it seems a little unreal. I mean, it's not every day that we hear about people rising from the dead, is it? Now, put yourself in Thomas's sandals for a moment. Pretend that you have never heard the story of Jesus' resurrection. And let's say that maybe you have uh, gone to a funeral down here at Herod's and, or somewhere and, uh, of a dear friend. A week later, you see another friend and they say, oh, 
You'll never guess who I saw at Serafini's last night. Why, well, you know, to, to, heck, to look at her, you'd never guess that she died last week. How would you react? Really, how would you react? And normally, the idea that someone would be walking around after having died the previous week is so far beyond the realm of possibility, we just wouldn't even entertain the thought of it. And yet, we somehow expect Thomas to accept this news in a very matter-of-fact way, like it's, this is no surprise at all. I tell you, Thomas has become the scapegoat for some people in, uh, in the church today who sometimes say that doubt is wrong. And that is somehow less than faithful. If we, if we need a sign or a touch or a vision or a personal encounter, we kind of get the impression that if we're not allowed to ask the hard questions, we're not allowed, allowed to ask the hard questions without somebody saying, Oh, you of little faith. And I'm going to tell you, friends, if that's the case, then scoot over because I'm going to the head of the line. Because <laughs> I need that in my doubts all the time. So, since when is doubt bad? Since when is it wrong to stand or to admit that we don't understand everything? Hmm? Since when is it wrong to ask God to clarify something? I mean, you can read in the Bible and you can find books that are filled with uncertainties and complaints and questions of God. I mean, friends, think of it. Even Jesus Christ, while He hung on the cross cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you've ever doubted, and you've ever wondered about God, then you are in a long line of faithful people who have raised their voices to ask hard yet faithful questions. My friends, faith comes when we're willing to embrace the doubts, that, when we're willing to ask the questions and face those answers. Faith believes in something that is beyond our ability to understand, but we're not afraid to try. All this summer long, we've been uh, kind of working our services around the phrase, may the faith be with you. It's a takeoff on the Star Trek theme, or Star Wars theme, sorry. But I want to tell you something. Faith takes work. Because it sometimes puts us in uncomfortable places. And it begs us to ask some very very tough questions. And I think, friends, the story of Thomas confirms our need for God's touch. It says that it's okay for us to ask the questions of God and to wish for a personal encounter. Faith cannot be reduced, friends, to a set of rules where everything fits and, and, and where everything makes sense, where all we have to do is connect the dots. Too many people today are trying to do that. They're trying to explain everything in a nice, neat formula to make all of life so that it can be answered by a set of rules. And if it doesn't fit within their set of rules, then those who disagree with them are considered the scum of the earth. And I dare say that if Christ were here today, their hearts would be close to Him because He wouldn't, he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't meet their criteria either. And their unwillingness to look outside the box blinds them, friends, of the miracle of Jesus Christ who, stu who stands in their very presence. My brothers and sisters, God comes to us in places where we sometimes least expect it. Sometimes our faith asks us to look outside the box. It's okay, go ahead, color outside the lines if you want to. And believe some things that the rest of the world will just simply say, well, that's ridiculous. I mean, faith begins with an encounter between God and us. And, and I, I have to have that encounter. 
I think you have to have it too. Without a personal encounter with God, the resurrection seems as silly as seeing, seeing Elvis at Kroger's the other day buying Snicker bars. You know, that's ridiculous. But an encounter with the, ris an encounter with the risen Christ changes all of that. Suddenly the bizarre, suddenly the unimaginable can become a new reality and rules, rules which once governed our believing and our unbelieving become very blurred. And even the lines between life and death, which once seemed so absolute, are crossed. My friends, faith is that crazy thing that allows us to believe when everybody else says, impossible. And this story that we've read today of Thomas, it's important to us, friends, because when we can see the possible through our cloudy and even disbelieving eyes, we suddenly can see an entire world of possibility far beyond what doubt would allow. My friends, God has overcome the grave. Are you hearing that? Everybody listening? God has overcome the grave. That ought to, can I get an amen? amen? And now God even overcomes those things that would lead to our death. And I'm thinking about things like disbelief and fear and hatred and narrowness of mind. And even though what I read to you today is a story about doubt, it's also about a miracle of faith that we are ultimately left with. Minds are open, hearts swell with words like, my Lord and my God. All because of a personal touch and a vision of the Lord. And without it, we just continue to wallow around in our own doubt. And, and, or, or we may remain a hostage, if you will, by the world's rules that cling to our impossibilities. My family, I'm just going to name this, we have all been a doubting Thomas at one time or another. But it, is our, in, in, it is, but it is into our doubting and searching hearts where Jesus Christ really breaks in and reveals himself to us. And the question is, will we give up on our doubting and accepting through faith in a loving God who really wants to relate to all of us that live in us? So here it is. I'm wondering... I'm wondering what it's going to take for all of us to at some point in our faith journey to cry out like Thomas, my Lord and my God. Let us pray. What will it take, Lord? What will it take for us to truly recognize your presence in our living. The power of your grace is always around us and among us. Your Holy Spirit gives us what we need day in and day out, hour by hour, moment by moment, breath by breath. Forgive us, O oh God, of our, of our doubts because we want to believe but we also say, help us with our unbelief. Have mercy on us now, Lord. And as we respond to the word, may, your, may the confidence of your presence in our living come among us all. And we give you thanks. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Friends, as we respond to the word, our ushers are preparing to come forward. So let's prepare ourselves to offer our gifts and our tithes to Almighty God. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, help us to give today with the full understanding and knowledge that all blessings come from you, and all things were created and given by you. Help us also to have the faith that you will provide. Now guide and direct and 
bless those who must administer these offerings to the glory of your kingdom. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
number 177 as we sing tw through twice, He is Lord. Let's sing together. confess you as our Lord and Savior now, and as we go from this place, God, may your peace, peace that passes all understanding, be upon all of us forever and ever. Amen. God bless all of you, and take a moment to greet one another before you go.